In recent decades, millions of people have drifted away from Jesus and their Catholic faith. Sadly, many may never find their way back. I'm Tom Peterson, and I believe that God has called me to use my background in media to be a catalyst in the new evangelization. Our organization produces inspiring and creative evangelization messages that have helped lead hundreds of thousands of inactive Catholics, converts, agnostics, and atheists home to Jesus and His Holy Church. Join us as we travel across North America to bring you stories of heartbreak, redemption, and transformation as the Holy Spirit leads His people home. God has an extraordinary plan for each of our lives. He wants us to spend eternity in heaven with Him and bring as many people with us as possible. This is Catholics Come Home. Now, I welcome you to my home to hear their amazing stories. Welcome to Catholics Come Home. In this episode, we'll meet a 68-year-old commercial realtor who was born in Jackson, Mississippi and grew up in Miami, Florida. During his childhood, our guest occasionally attended a Methodist church with his mother, but his family eventually stopped going to church at all. While contemplating the purpose of life, our guest wondered if life even mattered, thinking it's all over once you die. But as a young adult who wasn't sure what to believe, he encountered a series of thought-provoking circumstances that led him into a strong Presbyterian faith life and eventually home into the Catholic Church. Like everybody else in this series, today's guest came home to the church by responding to a call of the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to meet Scott Carter. Scott, welcome home to the Catholic Church and welcome to our home. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. We're looking forward to hearing your story and it's always fun for our audience and for me to find out where you grew up, where you were born, what your childhood was like. So let's start there. Well, I was born in Jackson, Mississippi. Oh. I left when I was four, so I don't remember anything about it. And then we moved to Fort Myers, Florida. Wow, big difference. Yeah, we lived right across the street from Fort Myers Country Club, so I grew up playing golf. Oh, you like golf. I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my parents played and I would have my buddies and we just stayed all day on the golf course. And what was your faith background growing up? My mother would take us to a Methodist church. Did you go every Sunday? We did, but my father didn't go. He usually just went on like Christmas, Easter, or whatever. But there was no really talking about anything of faith in the family other oh, than wow. a prayer when we ate. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. Amen. That was it. Huh? That was it. Wow. So faith wasn't an important part of your life. It was, I mean, you go to church on Sunday, the Methodist church, but that was about it. Yeah. And I think my mother probably had a strong faith, but it just wasn't talked about. And my father, that wasn't talked about. So uh, it just didn't have much going on in the family. Did you feel that you were missing something in life, not having that faith background? Did you not know the difference? What was your childhood like with that environment? Well, when I was going through it, I didn't like going to church. Uh, we, we also went to, my sister and I also went to, I believe it was on Wednesday for the children's choir. And so, I didn't really care for it. Nothing sticks in my mind about my faith or at, you know, at that point in time. It wasn't a real positive experience for you or a positive memory at the time. No, it was just part of what we did. So what did you end up doing in life? Did you go to college? What careers were you thinking about as you were growing up? Well, from Fort Myers, we moved to Miami. Mm -hmm. And during our time in Miami, I was converted uh, to Christ. Oh, how did that happen? Well, when I was a teenager, my sister had gone to college. She was two and a half years older. And so when we said that evening prayer, um, it was, she did it one night, I did it the other night. And when she went to college, I did it every night. Ah. And so I told my parents one night, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't believe it. Wow. Did you still believe in God? I didn't know. Ah. You were kind of in a dark place. Yeah, I was uh, probably 15, 14, starting to think about, you know, what's the point if I die 
tonight or if I die in 80 years, if I'm just going into the ground, what's the difference? And so that was uh, you know, something I was wrestling with and I didn't see an answer to the question. That's tough for a teen to wrestle with, that's for sure. Well, there was another turning point too that's related to golf. And I was playing golf one day and I had developed the habits of my buddies and we would hit golf shots and most of them weren't that great and you would curse and you would throw your club. Hmm. And so I was playing by myself and I was hitting several balls and throwing clubs and cursing. Wow. And then I walked down the fairway and I said, wow, if, if God's really there, I better not say this. Oh, that's and kind he, of an epiphany. And if he's not there, it doesn't make any difference. Right. So I stopped cursing right then. Isn't that something? Just yeah. had that awakening. Yeah. So praise God, you had a turning point. How specifically did that turning point happen where you brought Christ into your life and into your heart and it changed your, your life? I went to Campus Life, uh, which was a Protestant organization. and they Like met, youth ministers. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh, but it was just to the high school in general, so it wasn't part of a church per se. Gotcha. More evangelical in nature? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they started teaching, uh, making fun for all the kids, but at the same time, we did a Bible study, I started studying the book of Romans, which I never had read before. Started reading the Gospel of John. And so at the end of one summer, they had a kind of a big fun event with a Billy Graham type of call at the end of it and I went forward. In the next segment you'll see how Scott's life will change forever. Well, we came to the end of the road of our Presbyterianism. We didn't, we didn't fit and so where do we go? All my life I was searching for something that seemed to be just one step away. Perfect soulmate, the ideal job, that big adventure. And just when I thought I found what I was missing, I realized that I was never really fulfilled. Then I discovered what I was searching for was really faith in God and belonging to a church. You can find what you've been searching for too. Come and see at catholicscomehome.com. So we praise God that you accepted Christ in your life as that young adult and that the youth ministers were having an effect in presenting Christ to you. Uh, where did your life take you next? Right after that, I had a girlfriend at the time. I was probably 16. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she did not go forward at that same meeting. She was sitting beside to me. To the altar call, as right. they call it, huh? And so she thought that this was kind of foolishness, but she was still my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't too long after that that I felt God calling me to break up with her because she wasn't assisting me in my growth as a Christian. So I said to her, we need to break up because I want to follow God and follow Christ. It didn't make any sense at all to her. Wow. And so... Within a couple of days, I got really lonely because I had just lost my best friend. I called her up and said, can we date again? And she said no, she was so mad. So a couple of days later, she called me and she asked, can we date again? And I said no, because Christ had filled me. Yeah, praise God. Yeah. I see you're getting choked up. That was a pivotal point in your life where you had to choose between God or the world and you chose God. Yeah, and he took all the desire to have that friendship with her away. Yeah, because that wasn't what he had in store for your life. Yeah. So you have Christ in your life as a young adult now. Did you have a faith community eventually? Well, I went to different churches and became a Presbyterian. Okay. Did okay. you church hop and swap for a while? I did, um, trying to find mm -hmm. where to, to end up my parents started going to church right at the same time oh, I converted. Your dad too? My dad too. Wow, that's great. So and did you have an influence on his life? I think it was an influence, but they independently went to the Presbyterian Church. Oh. It was a PCA church, mm -hmm. Presbyterian Church in America. And so I didn't really have a place to go, so I went with them. I see. And then I ended up going from there. I went to Westminster Seminary for a year. Oh, wow. Interesting. 
And then when did Catholicism come onto your radar and what happened with that? Well, we were Presbyterians for probably, my wife and I, for 20 years. And so probably when I was around 38. And we were going to a Presbyterian church in Venice, Florida, and Steve Wood was the pastor. Oh, we know Steve Wood. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was quite content in my Presbyterian world. Steve was always kind of going outside the box, and we, he would read the Church Fathers, and I was an elder in the church, and so I would read the Church Fathers. Uh, we started having weekly communion in the Presbyterian Church. We didn't believe it was the same as the Catholic, but we started having, but it was still really neat. Everybody really in the congregation enjoyed it. We came to a crisis point because we had developed a lot of the theological positions that weren't fitting in the Presbyterian Church. Were they aligning a little bit more with Catholicism? Yes, but we didn't, I didn't know it at yeah. the time. Yeah. And the main one was the understanding of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Wow. From in a Presbyterian church. Sure. And I haven't talked to Steve about this for so long, but he became uncomfortable uh, giving communion to someone he knew would be married, divorced, and remarried. And this, even though it was symbolic and it wasn't Catholic, mm -hmm. he had some twinge in his heart about that. Yeah. So how did Steve Wood's journey into the Catholic Church affect yours, and when did you come in? Well, we came into the church in 1990. Uh, Steve Wood uh, started his, his journey right then, mm -hmm. and we were, he was giving us stuff to read, and we were following our journey. Steve was a friend of Scott Hahn's. Yes. I was introduced to Scott Hahn, talked to him over the phone, listened Great. to Scott Hahn tapes. Most of the theological issues were not a big hurdle for my wife and I. We joined the church together. Beautiful. Did Steve Wood help others from his community come into the Catholic Church at that time? There wasn't too many people that converted then. There were some people that converted later. He was very careful about not... Right. But you were among the first. Yeah. What was it about Catholicism that really touched a chord in you and your wife? Well, we came to the end of the road of our Presbyterianism. We, did, we didn't fit. And so, where do we go? Yeah. The Catholic understanding of all the different doctrines, and you take a little step and you look at it from a different angle, it all made sense. Sure. And there was nowhere else to go, and yet it, it was like coming home, though. It really was. And, and the, one of the neatest things was going into a Catholic church and kneeling for the first time. Wow. What went through your heart when you did that? Oh, just like I was home. That reverence where we're worshiping God. You know, so many people will say who have converted that it wasn't about the pastor or the celebrant or his homily or us paying attention. It was, when I became a Catholic, it was about the mass and the altar and worshiping God. Not being entertained, not listening for that sermon, but worshiping God. And when you're on your knees, it's humbling. It's allowing God to minister to us in our hearts, huh? It was such a wonderful thing to to be able to kneel and worship and, you know, I could care less whether, I mean, I really wanted a good homily, but yeah. it was just kneeling before God. Amen. I see you getting choked up a couple times during our, our sharing. Um, that's the Holy Spirit. When did the Holy Spirit become a pivotal part of your life? Well, I just think, you know, I had a tremendous conversion. You know, when we were, when we first married, we were committed to Christ as a couple. Nice. And raising our kids to know Christ. As Presbyterians at the time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep. I mean, we came to a Catholic understanding of birth control as a Presbyterian. Wow. And so uh, we had seven children. Natural family planning. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, I mean, it's just a progression. Yeah. Over how many years? And we became Catholic uh, in 1990. Oh, so quite a while. Yeah. So during this time when you came into the Catholic Church, what are the things that stand out when you think about those times as a new Catholic? Well, when we became Catholics, we, we understood that the Catholic Church wasn't perfect. Jesus' teachings are, but the humanity in it, right. we're the, all sinners people, in need of a Savior, yeah. huh? And you look at the Old Testament, it's the yeah. same way. It's, it's not perfect, but immediately we were living in Venice, Florida, and immediately we moved after we converted to Steubenville. Oh, wow. So we, 
went to Scott Hahn's weekly Bible study in his home. Uh, oh, we wanted, to, yeah, we wanted to have that type of yeah. um, input as new Catholics. And uh, Steubenville was great, but sure. couldn't live there uh, just job-wise and so forth. So we were only there for. And, a year. and winters are a little tougher than Venice, Florida, right? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Not too much golf time there. You chose to go there to put God first in your life and study the Catholic faith, which is beautiful. So really from that time that you opened your heart to Christ as a teen, wondering if there was anything in this world that mattered, and all of a sudden God jumps in your heart and you realize there's more to life and the, the more is God. And you put him at the center of your life. You haven't taken him away from that center point since, have you? No, no. I mean, it's always been focused. We homeschooled all of our kids and that was the reason we wanted them to put Christ first. Soon you'll learn how Scott's Catholic faith is yielding much good fruit. You know, ultimately in my conversion, I knew that I was a sinner and I knew I needed forgiveness. So many of us carry such heavy burdens. Come on, babe. It'll be fun. It's just you and me. Deep within, we struggle because sin separates us from God. But thanks to the grace of confession, God compassionately listens, forgives, and sets us free. So if it's been a while since you've been to confession or mass, come home and experience a fresh start. Visit catholicscomehome.org. So what is the key to a successful marriage? Well, I have an answer that might surprise you a little bit. Are you ready? Death. That's right, death. See, St. Paul tells us that God had a specific intent for marriage, a kind of formula that shows us how to make it work. And at the center of the formula is death to oneself. Paul says that when a man renounces himself completely and lays down his life for his spouse, and in the same way a woman dies to herself for the sake of her husband, a beautiful thing happens. It is only when a married couple chooses to individually die to their selfishness that love becomes perfect and the commitment is fully lived. That authentic love that was born from sacrifice becomes the bond that holds a marriage together a love that brings God's grace to children and grandchildren, and a love that shines as a light to the world. So here you are as a Catholic. When did your children become Catholic, and how did your family change once your whole family was practicing the Catholic faith? Well, all of our kids joined the church at the, when we joined. Oh, beautiful. And then the new ones became baptized as, as mm -hmm. infants. How did you see the dynamics from your existing family change when you all came into the church? Again, it just was a fullness of, of uh, this is home. This is, this is where Christ is. Yeah. You know, there's sacraments here. and Christ is here. He's Truly in, present right. in the Eucharist. So it was participating in that together. Yeah. yeah. As a convert, what was it like when you went to confession, sacrament of reconciliation for the first time? It was kind of a nerve-wracking thing, but it still is, to tell you the truth. <laughs> but theologically, you know, I had to overcome that hurdle. It made sense. It just was a yeah. little strange for you, a little new for you. Yeah, but it's going to confess my sins to Christ. And, you know, ultimately, in my conversion, I knew that I was a sinner and I knew I needed forgiveness. Amen. And so confession kind of really, it's just a fullness of understanding. It's that. beautiful. And what's nice, and we have a site called goodconfession.com that's a spinoff of Catholics Come Home, and we do it to explain the sacrament of reconciliation. And one of the most beautiful things is when you can, you know, the way God gave this gift to us through his priesthood, you know, Peter, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. What sins you hold bound are bound, and what sins you've forgiven are forgiven. And that passes down through the priesthood, where the priest is in persona Christi, in the confessional. But isn't it beautiful where we as humans here, you are absolved of your sins. You're forgiven in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know we're forgiven. Not just driving in our car, God, I did this, do you forgive me? Uh, you know, like we know, we know when we leave that confessional, we're forgiven and we're filled with grace. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, and just looking at the confession line is kind of interesting because mm. the old people, young people, 
all of us need to go to God and, Amen. And, and, and be renewed. We all need His mercy and forgiveness, don't we? When we look back at your Presbyterian days and we compare them to your days when you had not much faith, if any, and then we look at Catholicism, what do you know now that you didn't know back then? I know that our faith in Christ is all there is. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want for my kids, my yeah. grandkids, just to know that wherever they turn, however difficult life can become, that Christ is with them. Praise God. I want to celebrate your family. How many children do you have? How many grandchildren do you have? Uh, seven kids and 25 grandkids. Praise God. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, I often say that if uh, we Catholics can't help bring others home, we'll just have more Catholics. And obviously your family is helping with that cause. In conclusion, we've got about a minute left. What is on your heart today in the world and in the church? What are the things you're on your knees most for? What do you pray about most? Well, there's a lot of things I just can't do anything about. So uh, I have a focus on my family. Yeah. And I pray for all of my grandkids and all of my kids every day. I, I've, for the last five or six years, I've sent them a, a, a blessing. A, I call it the daily blessing. I email it to them. Beautiful. Because we, we were raising the kids and we became Catholics. We would bless them every night. On the forehead. On the, the forehead. Cross, yep. And so I'm doing the same type of thing mm -hmm. through email because I can't get to them. Sure. And then I'll give them a, a thought of the day of mine of what, what I think uh, Christ is doing in my heart and, and then give them the blessing. Tremendous. We're so thankful you're a wonderful grandfather uh, in helping to promote the faith to those young grandchildren. What a great charism. We're so thankful that you said yes to God. We're so thankful that you took his calling seriously and came home to the Catholic Church and brought your whole family with you. Welcome home. Uh, thank you. Let's talk about living the faith at home. When we seek to live a vibrant, intentional Catholic life all the time, and not only at Mass on Sundays, the faith takes root and blossoms in our lives in the most fruitful way. As is often the case in our spiritual lives, we make a small offering of faith and trust, and God multiplies it beyond our wildest imagination. Today, I wanna to talk about the number one tool in forming our children and grandchildren as disciples of Jesus Christ and His Church. As spiritual leaders in our families, parenting first and foremost looks like helping lead the children God gifted us with back to Him. In the little years, this is really pretty simple. St. Augustine said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord. And it's like our young kids know that from the start. They're like little sponges already prepared to soak up God's love for them, first through us as we mirror the loving parenthood of God for them by caring for their needs. Then we help them foster those warm feelings and associations of love and comfort and excitement that they have with Jesus and their faith, while establishing family traditions of prayer and worship and celebration. And then comes the chance to shepherd our children through the rest of their childhood by helping our children to make connections between the stories they've heard or read in the Bible, the lives of the saints and all those catechism lessons, and their actual lives to help them become the people God made them to be. I often talk about our job as adults being to plant the seeds of faith. But honestly, in some sense, those seeds have already been planted by their Creator. They were made for Him, and He put that great potential in their hearts to know Him, love Him, and serve Him. We just have to help unlock that potential, to help water those seeds, to work with the tools God gives us as moms, dads, grandmothers, and grandfathers to help form our children into little disciples. But our number one tool is the love of Jesus Christ. St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, before Jesus explained the Beatitudes to the crowd, he felt compassion for them and fed them. Only after they were fed did he start to teach them. Our children are first and foremost hungry for God's love. We all are. As the adults who love them, we have the great responsibility and beautiful privilege of reminding the children we encounter every day of God's deep love for them, of bringing them into contact with God's love through us, through prayer, through the church. In his letter to children, Pope St. John Paul II wrote, God loves you, dear children. This is what I want to tell you. 
It really is the most important thing. Here's your opportunity to grow in faith and help Jesus save souls. Visit our CatholicsComeHome.org website and click on the Shop tab. Here, you can discover our four brand new popular books to help you and those you love grow closer to Christ. The Willpower Advantage, Building Habits for Lasting Happiness, includes a personal spiritual audit and a customized plan to help you fight lifelong vices and find freedom in Christ. One Moment Can Change a Soul helps you guide family and friends home to the Catholic faith. Plus, two beautifully illustrated children's books to help your children or grandchildren stay close to Jesus. Epic, the story of Jesus' Holy Catholic Church and Santa's Priority, keeping Christ in Christmas. You can also order a car magnet to evangelize in traffic, evangelization cards, and DVDs with all of our best episodes of our international television series. If you have a question or want to tell us how Catholics Come Home has blessed someone you know, or you can financially help us blitz the secular airwaves with these powerful evangelicals, contact us at info at catholicscomehome.org or by mail. Catholics Come Home, P.O. Box 1802, Roswell, Georgia 30077. Please help Jesus save more souls. During his adolescence, Scott spent more time perfecting his golf game than he did contemplating God or what happens after death. But thanks to God's grace, Scott knew there had to be more to life and began his faith journey. After much church shopping and church hopping, Scott became Presbyterian. Then, through the influence and conversion of his pastor, Steve Wood, discussions with his former classmate, Dr. Scott Hahn, and the study of the early church teaching on God's plan for marriage, Scott and his family became Catholic within the year. Now, over 30 years later, Scott and his family are devout in their Catholic faith, helping others who seek to find God's truth in Jesus' church. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Catholics Come Home. Please keep Scott and the Carter family and all of us at Catholics Come Home in your prayers. Remember to fulfill your role in the new evangelization and help love somebody to heaven. I've got love, somebody to heaven. I've got love, somebody.